the goal, we can get into the issues you bring up about uh, athletic competency. How well can they execute the load? Uh, and then we get into the biological issues, like what is the training volume? If the, if the volume is low and the load is low, uh, the body will tolerate uh, lots of mistakes. But when you add high volume with high load and uh, more intense training and, and less uh, rest and, and these kinds of things, uh, those mistakes or its incompetencies are going to become critical. Right. My Muscle Project, welcome back to a round two with uh, Dr. Stuart McGill. And you know, we've had some uh, discussions off air which I do want to get into, but uh, Stuart, the probably the best place to start this is from an episode that we did recently which gained a lot of popularity. I, f- I felt like it was going to be controversial, uh, was a little bit controversial, however, I think a lot of people, after hearing my explanation of it, did agree with what I was saying. Um, and basically, what I what I talked about for you know the, a good thirty minutes on an episode, which is uh, Raf and myself, was I didn't think that for I want to say like ninety nine percent of people that go to gyms, I don't think they should be back squatting. Um, and the, a lot of the reasons I gave was because um, I just very rarely see it being executed properly. Um, it's extremely difficult. It involves a lot of skill adaptations, a lot of mobility a lot of balance and the kind of the issue I felt was like it doesn't really punish you like other exercises for being out of position. You can manipulate because the weight kind of sits over your spine, you can kind of create so many compensations down the chain during the movement uh, that like compromises so many aspects of your body, knees, hips, uh, back especially um, and I've seen a lot of people get injuries um, from, from back squatting and so firstly, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts like if you kind of agree or disagree with with that, if you if you feel like you know, it would just be better without back squats, um, maybe doing front squats or or sandbag squats instead. Um, and then I guess the second part of that question is, um, do you think that deadlifts is a much better uh, sort of strength substitute just for general population? Because I I think that that is a much better exit uh, better exercise to execute long term, um, just for the back in general, assuming it's done well. Okay, well, uh, I think you know the two words that I'm going to have to begin that answer with. It does depend. It does depend. I was just going to say it depends, <laughs> short version. Um, it depends for a lot of reasons. Uh, so you're discussing an exercise here. And an exercise is simply a tool to reach a goal. Uh, so I I can't even begin to answer that until I know what the goal is. And then once we know the goal, we can get into the issues you bring up about uh, athletic competency. How well can they execute the load? Uh, And then we get into the biological issues, like what is the training volume? If the if the volume is low and the load is low, uh, the body will tolerate uh, lots of mistakes. Mm. But when you add high volume with high load and uh, more intense training and, and less uh, rest and, and these kinds of things, uh, those mistakes or its incompetencies are going to become critical. So that that's how I would uh, open that. Um, well, sh- should we even do squats? Boy, ag- again, that depends. Um, is there an alternate? Quite often, I mean, as you know, I'm a back pain specialist. So say someone uh, comes to see me with back pain and we go through their history and I do a little bit of an assessment and they tell me that uh, squats are in their program and then I find that they have uh, back pain when we mimic a deep squat and then I see their form isn't very good, I'll say, well, what's the goal? And if they say, oh, well, I just want to look good or no, I want to get power out of that deep squat position. Say they're a rugby prop and uh, they're going to have to get into that low position and create hip drive. Well, again, those are two different things. Uh, If it's just someone who wants to look good, have less pain, um, uh, maybe 
let's find a complete substitute for squats. For example, do you just want to push a load? Push a car back and forth in the parking lot. It's not very sexy. It's hard to measure, but they might be better athletes doing that. Uh, if it's someone who just wants to feel good and look good with low risk, uh, I might say, good, go run the uh, stadium stairs or the stairs of City Hall, whatever stairs you have in uh, Bondi Junction, and then go find a hill. And I know there's some near you. Now walk backwards up a hill through the knees, pushing through the knees, and you will get a quad burn like you've never felt before. <laughs> Uh, do you, how many squats do you really want to do? And your back doesn't pay the price. And then I would say, go back down to the bottom of the hill. Now power up the hill. The brain perceives exhausted quads, and then it goes and gets the hip extensors like they've never gotten them before. So, you know, there's layers upon layers in, uh, answering, uh, that question. Um, the, the, the next scientific principle is, uh, governed by the tipping point. And as we all know, every biological system has a tipping point. So if you're below that point, it builds your body. If you cross it, it tears it down. Um, I would need to know the athlete's injury history, their age, uh, other exercises that they're doing besides the squats and whatnot, and see how close they are to that uh, tipping point. Then I might say, well, okay, they're doing a squat. Uh, are they doing a front squat or a back squat? Well, the back squat's going to emphasize more hip drive. A front squat's going to emphasize more knee and leg drive. What happens if we have a downhill skier, very popular in Australia, or uh, someone who's back injured, they're a cyclist, for example, and they need tremendous leg athleticism. They're used to doing squats. I might completely take out the whole issue of front squat, back squat, and do a belt squat. So a squat with a belt around the waist, completely eliminate the back load and all the thrust lines of the load down through the back. And we can get right back to training heavy squat, leg strengthening and hip strengthening patterns again. Um, just as I was speaking, there, there's, there's one final example that I'll give you to emphasize this, uh, it depends kind of a, a, an answer to show that it, it's not an avoidance at all. It is really a method of approaching the best use of science. We did this experiment twice on volleyball teams, just because we were asked. A coach said, could, could you, uh, and it wasn't me, it was one of my graduate students, could you increase the vertical jump height of our volleyball team? And after doing the experiment twice, we got exactly the same answer. It was predominantly a back squat uh, kind of intervention over, I forget how many weeks, say it was eight weeks or 10 weeks. Half the team added a, two or three centimeters, maybe five centimeters to their vertical jump. 10%, 15%, it made no difference on. And 35% of the team lost height off wow. their vertical jump, all doing the same squat programming. And uh, if, well, we found out very quickly, had we just asked two questions, we would have been able to optimize who got squat training and who didn't. Um, if you ask the team a question, are you naturally quick or are you naturally strong? Then uh, tell the naturally quick players to go over to the right side of the room and naturally strong over to the left. Who do you think with the same squat program increased their vertical jump? Naturally quick. Yes, exactly. So those who have a fast neurology, a quick neuro or explosive neurology, when you add more squat strength to that, it increases the power production for a uh, higher time in the air, basically. <clears throat> But those who are already strong, <laughs> when you add more strength to strength, they actually slowed down and uh, lost power production <laughs> and created more strength and more stiffness. Mm. So isn't that interesting? And then when if, if you want to get into a deadlift discussion, that to me is an entirely different enterprise. Mm. And it's, uh, it's a whole body stiffness. We get grip strength into the equation, uh, pulling out of the lifter's wedge on the floor. Um, 
to, to just I, I wish you didn't ask me that <laughs> the same <laughs> question because it is such a uh, a, a different uh, That's right. endeavor. But both are highly technical lifts. Yeah, sure. well, we'll just stay on the back squat, I guess. Um, to answer some of your questions, to kind of narrow it down, it depends to maybe be able to give them more sp- specific responses. Yeah, generally, like you said, the goal of these people trying to execute the back squat is they're trying to look better, right? They're trying to just, you know, have more muscle, improve their body composition, look good naked. They're just trying to be out of pain, right? This is most people that come to the gym. That's essentially what they want. Uh, Far less people come to the gym looking for an improvement in their performance um, of sport. But however, I think that the new media with Instagram and YouTube has created a very romantic um, version or uh, just an appeal of, of the back squat being like this this king of all exercises. Um, and I think a lot of people are coming in, they, they want to get really good at back squatting because that's what the girl or the guy on Instagram or the girl or the guy on YouTube is always taking photos with, or always doing in their training. And they they look like that or they get those results because they back squat. Uh, and so all these people are coming in, or the public's coming in, especially to our facilities and they care way more about the back squat than they do any other movement. Um, And so uh, obviously it's part of our job to educate them or to help them understand or even help us understand, okay, why did you get this way? Why is there so much emphasis on the back squat? And it's a hard thing to get people to unsell themselves on it because what I find is with the amount of time that we have with that person, you know, which starts with personal training but ends up being three to four hours a week in in a group setting, is it still is one of those exercises which I feel like is just so hard to execute to a degree which I'm happy for them to do it. Now, like you said, I could definitely take the load down. I could definitely take the volume out, um, but it upsets people. They go, no, 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 I'm not progressing or I'm not going heavy enough or I can do more. Um, But I just know there's, I always see shifting. I always see the butt tucking underneath um, and there's just not the time in their day for me to be able to give them the corrective exercises nor do they have the patience to do it. They're kind of coming in expecting to get results of three to four times, three to four hours per week. Um, and so I'm just kind of making what I feel is the realistic judgment that this might just be something that's easier to just not use at all for this population because of how difficult it can be to execute. And people are sitting all day in their chairs, so they're already creating so much compression on their backs. And the last thing I want to do, if I'm trying to look after this person, is to you know have them under extremely heavy loads, not executing the movement properly. Well, do you want to comment on that? Well, I just thought I just wanted to know if yeah, you, if you had comments on that, or if you would agree with that. If it was like you know your facility, well, yeah, or people yeah, on, only in part. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, my world is to enhance performance and reduce pain. There are some people who, I guess, it's social media forces to some degree, but until they get back pain or until they get hurt, you can't motivate them. You know, smoking didn't cause cancer, uh, or, or there are still some people who think it's not going to ha- happen to them and they continue to smoke. They know what it's going to do to them or at least change their risk. So using that same logic, how could you say something to a, uh, a, a person who's been sold on squatting? I mean, I've tried to work with some people and uh, for them, we've determined that uh, another programming uh, tool should be used and yet they can continue to do it. Um, However, as soon as they become pained and it's rather unfortunate, now they come to you and are much more likely to listen to your advice. Mm. So that's just a comment that that it's very hard to motivate the uninjured. Do you do you find though that in your experience the back squat is a hard movement for people to execute well? It depends on the person. Some are impeccable and some are horrible. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the average way. person, uh, you know, if they're a good athlete, I, I mean, there's things that uh, life isn't fair. If you have the perfect squat body, which would be uh, shorter legs, longer body. Uh, good starting lordosis, not a flat back in, in, in standing. I mean, all the 
studies that we've done over the years to measure even just the resting curve of the low back in standing is going to heavily influence squat mechanics. Mm. Um, how deep do they think they need to go? Is it consistent with their hip joint, with their spine curvature, etc.? cetera? Um, some people just naturally had the gifts and uh, they're quite okay. Uh, you know, you, you look at lifters and i'm not talking about people who train at the local gym with olympic lifts i'm talking about real lifters in the olympics very rarely do i see one for a back issue it's almost always a hip or a shoulder or a knee issue mm. now power lifters are a different kettle of fish it's almost always in my world a back issue with them so both squat uh, or at least train them and uh but they're they're really quite different athletes so th th you see why i'm kind of stuck on this it depends mm -hmm. and uh for some people it's it's quite magical and for others it's uh boy it's quite not contraindicated yeah. i think what, <laughs> what i see a lot is yeah some people are really really not built for it and you see it like as soon as they walk in they got really really long legs and right better suited to 800 meter running but tell me if i'm wrong but i feel like with the deadlift maybe you don't get the same problems where there's definitely some people that are more built for the deadlift, but it's not like as much you're really, really going to struggle with the deadlift long term, which you do see with the squat just based off someone's genetics. Uh, I, I see them as one and the same in terms of genetic predisposition. Hmm. So some people really not built for the deadlift. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If, uh, but again, you, you, you stylistically, uh, you see people uh, performing different types of deadlifts, you know, the full spectrum from sumo through to conventional. And then uh, are they training to be of legal powerlifting federation depth or are they just pulling from the floor to, to enhance their fitness? If that's the case, pull off blocks. Yeah. And uh, better match, ma match the anatomy with their leg length, with their whatever to uh, enhance the ratio of reward to risk. Mm. Yeah, so, I just want to, uh, I'll stay on the point with your um, power lifters and Olympic lifters. Um, you know, I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen uh, West Side vs. the World? The documentary? Uh, no. Okay. I've certainly, I mean, I know an awful lot of West Side lifters. Yeah. And um, yeah, so they created the documentary. It's been in the works for like, man, I want to say five years or six years or something because and i'm sure they have lots of interviews with louis yeah tons of stuff anyway you'd love it it's incredible but one of the things that um happens or one of the stories that gets played over and over again one of the running themes is how many surgeries louis had and how quickly he was able to come back from these surgeries and and, and continue training and it made me think and you know you get you get this all the time in the gym is that people you know they get some kind of serious back pain um and they're told they need surgery. And I always wondered to myself, okay, how often can we rehab out what is the cause of this pain or whatever the, the surgery is supposed to be? Like how bad can it be that we can still recover it with correct rehab work? Um, because, you know, it, in my case, I think worst case scenario is you start cutting people open and playing around with discs. Like I want to try and avoid that as much as possible. So, um where is kind of like the point of no return? Obviously, like I know you're going to say it depends. I love that explanation, but... I no, I'm going to give you a hard statistic for the first time. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's good. Yeah, I want to know like, yeah, how can we avoid more surgeries than, than what we're currently sort of prescribing? Can we rehab? Yeah, I'll keep you on your toes for this one. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Oh, over my years at the university, we followed up with every patient that I saw. Mm -hmm. We also knew how they came in, what subcategory they fit in terms of pain mechanism, whether they complied, how they did, and all that kind of thing. So we know that of all the patients who were told, you've tried everything and surgery is your last option. Of all the patients who came in being told that surgery is their last option, we got 95% of them to avoid surgery, and they were glad they did. So there's a hard statistic for you, and I've measured that. Wow, that's crazy. So uh, that I can uh, be assured of. Um, I also, in, in the last book I wrote for the lay public, uh, I also know that those who simply read the book are... Uh, 
more often than not able to avoid surgery as well. But uh, I, I can continue on that whole process if you like. Mm. What what book was that? Is this the gift of? Uh, it's called Back Mechanic. Okay. The one I wrote for Lay Public. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, as you know, most of my books. I, I twenty years ago, I never thought in a million years I'd be writing for the lay public. I my first book was a, a medical text to you know for clinicians <laughs> dealing with patients and back pain, and the next one I wrote for for coaches and and athletes. Mm. Um, I, I never thought I'd write a book for the lay public, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I can certainly give you guidelines on how to increase your or the person's uh, wisdom of their choice regarding surgery, if you like. Yeah, that would, that would be good because I think that a lot of doctors do prescribe surgery. I mean, they just don't have the years and decades of knowledge and research that you have and you know, just the foresight to know that, okay, I know that only 5% of the people that step in front of me that have told, been told they need surgery actually need it. A lot of doctors have probably had some quite a lot of success prescribing a surgery and that's why they continue to. So, yeah, how can people sort of, I guess, self-diagnose, for lack of a better term, to to kind of find out, okay, I've been told I need surgery. How do I really know if I'm the 95% or the 5%? Right. Well, there's no substitute for an expert assessment. Yeah. The problem is there are very few people who are well enough trained to execute a thorough assessment. When I see a back pain patient, I set aside three hours. And I, if I thoroughly assess the person and come up with a program and a strategy for them, I'll spend uh, three hours doing so, which is very unconventional in the uh, medical world. But here's the, the, the assessment reveals the cause of pain. Once you know the pain, then you can ask the question, can you cut it out with a knife? Now, if you can, and uh, you can do so in a way with very little risk and you have a chance for a high reward with no other available options. Now, that would be a good risk surgery. However, for that reward to remain very high, there only must be one source of pain. This is not often the case. So uh, usually uh, back pain people have more than one uh, mechanism to their pain. So the surgery uh, has little chance for success. If, say, a person has a disc bulge or they've been diagnosed with a flattened disc and some radiologist gives them the term, oh, you've got degenerative disc disease. Well, if they've got it at two levels, what do you think surgery at one level is going to do? Right. So there are all of these uh, considerations. The next is Surgery often doesn't address the cause. So say they have a very specific fissured annulus uh, posterior on the right-hand side. Uh, so they sit on the starboard side of the crew of eight rowing shell. We know exactly what the cause of that disc bulge <laughs> yeah. is. It's forward bending to the, to the left, uh, causing a right-sided disc bulge because left-sided uh, rowers get the right side of disc bulges. Yeah. It's it's pretty much one to one. Now, what do you think uh, having a surgery will do, and then going right back to that yeah. same seat in the boat? Yeah. You haven't addressed the cause, and th th that's a very overt uh, example. But people get back pain for specific reasons. They've created a, a mechanical overload. And the surgery doesn't change their behavior. So they go right back to that and, oh, guess what? Now they've re-herniated. Well, surprise, surprise. Um, or the next level above will, will uh, uh, be the one that uh, will succumb. So uh, why does surgery work for some people too? That's a very interesting question. I am absolutely convinced that surgery works for some because it's forced rest. Now, let me give you an example there. Mm. So say you have a stay-at-home mom who shows up at your gym. Got a young child at home. She gets the afternoons off. She's going to come and train, train with you. And then you interview her to try and get an understanding of, of how you're going to program her. And she says, you know, if I don't ride the elliptical for 20 minutes, I'm going to murder my husband. And then I need to do this. La -dee -da -dee -da. And if I don't do it, I'm, I'm in, it's my mental stress reliever. Yeah. Hmm. 
And then she tells you, and I've got this intransigent pain down the back of my right leg. And, <laughs> and it gets worse than I ride on the, tr- on, the, on the elliptical. And then you suggest to her that there might be a link between the two. And you suggest, you know, I need you to back off the elliptical. It's causing your sciatica. And, uh, you know, you've measured that she's got a stiff hip on that one side. So instead of moving her hip now on the elliptical, she has to move her pelvis Mm. with every cycle of load. And and she's getting nerve root irritation. Um, But she'll say no. And then you'll say, fine, go have your surgery. Now, what did the surgery do? For the first time, she was forced to rest because the hospital won't let her get on the elliptical the next day. So then we play a game called virtual surgery. We make a deal with her and say, let's pretend you had serious surgery today, and tomorrow you're going to behave like you're post-surgical. You're going to relax. We're going to slowly rebuild your motor patterns. And we're going to replace some of the other patterns. We're going to let your body rest, slowly desensitize its pain. And then we're going to methodically and scientifically build a foundation for you to move pain-free. Now, how can you beat that? Mm. But it was the forced rest and the surgical process of recovery. Now, if you could mimic that in your training gym, you just wouldn't need to actually cut the nerves, remove bone, uh, etc. So from that perspective, and I've measured that, by the way, uh, virtual surgery uh, is very effective for the exercise addict. Mm. So with, um, with the disc tissue uh, specifically, does it, can it regenerate? Like if you have a bulge or whatever, can that tissue itself like grow and, and heal? Or is it like once it starts to tear and stuff, can it not repair? Well, it's a perfect question, uh, and the answer is it depends, but maybe not in the way that you're conceiving traditional tissue repair. Okay. So the disc is made up of strands of collagen held together by a ground substance. Consider it a goo if you want to think like that. Mm. And a disc bulge, uh, there are so many different subcategories. If you let a little air out of your car tire, your car tire bulges. When you Same thing with your disc. If you let a little bit of gel pressure release, either through an end plate fracture or some, some other kind of injury, you get a broad-based bulge all around. You won't repair that okay. uh, with anything other than restoring disc height, which is very difficult to do. So... Uh, that is what it is. And generally speaking, over time, the ground substance will gristle if you stop doing pushed end range of motion and that kind of thing. And uh, it will slowly gristle, stiffen, and settle down. Um, If the uh, collagen fibers have delaminated at a single point, a focal point, and then you get a very focal kind of a disc bulge, uh, that won't repair uh, either. What you will do uh, if you apply the appropriate uh, rehab, you will stop the cause and take the hydraulic pressure, pushing the nucleus through that focal delamination. Um, It's very possible to vacuum in the uh, disc bulge, and then by removing the movement cause, it will gristle and plug up and become resilient once again. Now, how long does that take? In some people, it can take 10 years. In other people, it can be quite rapid. So I'm giving you a a biological spectrum. So my point is it will never heal so that uh, it's as good as new, shall we say that. But um, think of all the great athletes and every single one that I see is never a pristine athlete who isn't managing an orthopedic issue. Mm. The great ones are the ones who are most successful at managing their injuries Mm. and they manage it through uh, training changes, stylistic changes in their uh, athletic performance or whatever it happens to be. So uh, I'm not trying to run around that. I'm I'm just trying to say there's, there's many different flavors of uh, disc bulges. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example of the typical lifting athlete, who gets a posterior disc bulge when they bend forward and have butt wink, let's say, getting back to that squat issue that you were talking about earlier. But that only uh, that's usually from an overload in a strength lifting kind of athlete. Let's take a yoga master. 
yoga yogis typically have quite plump discs. They don't stress their discs with a lot of load, but their collagen becomes more lax and supple because of the bending that they do, but they don't take heavy load. Now, when they bend forward, their posterior disc bulge flattens because they put their collagen into tension. It's a plump disc. And then when they move into extension, the annulus is soft and it buckles and it buckles out. So they get disc bulges when they extend. Uh, whereas the lifting athlete got a disc bulge when they bent forward. You see, that's a hydraulic mechanism. Whereas the person who's much more mobile and doesn't uh, practice training with heavier loads, their collagen is loose and it buckles on the compressive side. So there's two different disc bulges, very, very different uh, mechanisms. So with the yogi, they would actually do better with more load. And we do see this in uh, certain kinds of athletes and they say, my back feels great when I add load. Mm. But if I just have to move my back around it, say a night on the dance floor, <laughs> going to a wedding, that really flares them up. But, oh, let me lift some lumber here and build your back deck for you. My mm. back feels great. Mm. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds the like assessment always gives you the precision of, right. of the mechanism. Right. I mean, it just sounds like to have optimal disc health, you need the, you know, most appropriate volume, but the the most varied combination of all those things. You need some mobility and flexibility work, but you also need the compression of the correct amount of loads with the right volume, because the spine wasn't just meant to be super loose and and lax and and bend in extreme positions, um, but it also wasn't meant to you know, get underneath 900 pounds and, and do it for, you know, a quarter squat. It's supposed to kind of have a little bit of everything um, to strengthen things. And it just seems like that approach to fitness is kind of an approach to wellness as well. Of course it is. Yeah. Think of every system in the body. Every system in the body depends on movement for good health, even your teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we have to go back to that concept of the tipping point loading movement it's all good as long as you're below the tipping yeah. point and then when you cross the tipping point instead of building the health of that tissue it tears it down or you know you, everything take vitamin d if you're deficient you're sick mm -hmm. you take a supplement you get up to the tipping point it's healthy you cross the tipping point it becomes a poison yeah and it's but the the, the trick of it all is to know where that tipping point is for the client in front of you mm. and what do you think the olympic lifters are doing differently to the power lifters that allows them to lift heavy loads really often and still rarely come to you with back pain yeah, they're much more disciplined in uh, the power production being at the hip. Interesting. So they're they're better. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's some stylistic nuances uh, from around the world, but typically the Olympic lifters keep their back locked throughout the whole lifting cycle. Um, now, interestingly, with power lifters. Those who will flex forward through their spine, A, you will notice that the ones who survive well typically have more thoracic flexion than lumbar flexion, but they lock it. So even though they're, they're slightly flexed uh, throughout the deadlift pull, they lock it. So the, the, the very best uh, in terms of injury resilience would be, say, like an Olympic lifter who locks their back and the power comes out of the hips. But they became Olympic lifters because they had the hips to become it. Most power lifters could never be Olympic lifters because they don't have the hip uh, anatomy to allow them to preserve that pristine locked uh, spine. Yeah. So they uh, pull from depth um, and, and some do flex their back, but they lock their back in that flex position and pull their hips through. So when they're upright standing, they go for the final spinal lockout. You'll find the ones that have the worst backs flex their back and then slowly extend it as they're pulling the weight through the uh, hinging process. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the worst combination in terms of uh, uh, creating disc damage. That's one of the cues I always give my athletes, which I think is probably um, what a lot of people think is wrong or they they were taught differently is that when you deadlift, uh, a lot of people give the cue to retract your shoulder blades um, to 
um, basically, you know, hold in your upper, upper back muscles, upper back muscles, sorry, uh, as tight as possible. Uh, and I always tell people that, you know, it's only going to take a certain amount of load um, for you to immediately default back to um, a bit of thoracic flexion and your shoulders coming forward. Um, and I always tell people like, you know, you've got to imagine that uh, if you're under your heaviest load, what would be the most, um, or what's like the strongest position for the body? And so I try and get them to think about that while they're going through a lift, even at, at lighter loads. Um, uh, and, you know, the same thing, the same principles applies. You don't want any movement through your back. Um, but I always tell people it's going to be much harder to hold your shoulder blades retracted because it's it's now going to be dependent. You holding your back in position is now going to be dependent uh, on like your shoulder blade ret- retraction strength because as soon as that load gets really heavy, they're just going to come unstuck and your shoulders are going to move forward. Um, so the cue I give a lot of my athletes is to hold, to start in that slightly shoulder forward position, having their chest on, their lats on and just having that slight um, or more more of a natural thoracic curve rather than a forced thoracic extension that they're trying to hold um, through the lift. Um, is that something you'd agree with? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> if, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asking why on earth would a normal person who, who isn't being paid a million dollars to deadlift, why on earth are they going that heavy? Uh, they're actually shortening their athletic career. Mm. Uh, if the goal of that person is to be the best grandmother or the best grandfather when they're 80, I suggest they're using the wrong tool with the wrong type of load. Uh, go to the uh, orthopod and see who's getting uh, joint replacement. It'll be the ones who did nothing or the ones who lifted really, really heavy, one of the two. The uh, people, as you were talking about earlier, who, who found the modicum are the ones who are the most successful orthopedically uh, through their lives. So um, I, I, I question why that duffer who is just training for health is getting into a kind of load where the load is forcing their shoulders to round. I mean, that's a pretty heavy load. Um, why are they doing that? So that that's why my answer on that one uh, is uh, it depends. But if their job is, is powerlifting, we're going to back off all the mobility and make them stiffer that, than they can possibly be. We're going to put elastic neoprene lifting suits on them to stiffen them up even more. Stiff, stiff, stiff. Now, don't ask them to throw a baseball because they can't. They'll have difficulty putting on their socks and scratching their ear. But that's the price they paid for that ability to bear supreme load. That's not what most people want. So you're saying that even if you're not lifting for that kind of load, that if you were doing your light load, say 50% of, of your heaviest load, you would put people in a uh, shoulders retracted position in thoracic extension and try and get them to... Well, I, 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 I would use different cues yeah. for sure. But that's kind of the, yeah. the end... Well, Ed, you know, what I would do there is uh, put them into a hands on knees squat position. And then from there, I would have them, I, I'd put a block on the, uh, put the bar on blocks, or I'd put a wooden dowel on blocks and set up their lifters wedge at that height and then teach them to grab the bar and I wouldn't retract their shoulders. No, what I would do is they squeeze the bar harder and harder and then just start to twist the bar and that cue will start the bar moving now we've got the bar moving um whether i would retract their shoulders or not i don't know but i would certainly use that pec lat cue to stiffen and use the stiffness to squeeze the bar to get it moving so you would want to you'd want to see pec and lats working, yes, during the movement. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it squeeze the bar around the knees, like bend it bend over the, the knees, bar. bend it around the it, knees. Yeah, just 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 do that to the bar, and already you've gotten the bar moving. Mm. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who can't so see, your wedge, but it'll only work if you're supremely tight in the bottom of the. Uh, in the beginning of the poll. But now let me ask you a question. Why on earth would the average person be interested in this? Well, people are. <laughs> well, it's more just like they want to know what the, how to... Well, they, the maybe best. they are, but I'm going to tell them they're easier to kill. <laughs> Why don't they get a more diversity to their athleticism? Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, well, I mean, we're not we're not speed. putting those people under that sort of load, uh, just in case anyone's wondering. But um, well, I have to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my job yeah. <laughs> to, to to create athleticism for for every athletic event out of a, a bad back pain situation. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, yeah, okay. So I wanted to move to um, a question on. Um, well, I guess we kind of addressed it before, but. Uh, I think a lot of people are generally, and you've probably seen this, obviously the majority of the population is stuck in spinal extension in their lower back, mainly just due to sitting a lot and um, just like that kind of forward head position, like stomach sticking out position. Um, Obviously, a lot of people are overweight, so their stomach kind of pulls them forward as well. Um, And these are all like what I see is like lifestyle related spine positions or, or posture taught positions. What are the things that you would be doing to help people reduce the the damage that they're causing from um, you know being stuck in these positions most of the day I need to get a clarification here sure. so you're talking about the type of body type that when they're standing they just hang on their passive tissues they slump down and their low back goes into extension their belly hangs forward flaccid yes. and they're getting extensor driven pain yes oh well uh, that's not something i get asked uh, very often very good well first of all i would see if that is a pain trigger for them it may or it may not be Uh, then I would want to know, do they even have a fitness goal? Because when I see that, it it really is a default um, strategy to avoid using muscle. It would be considered poor posture, which is just hanging on the passive tissues. Mm. Over time, those passive tissues are going to become sensitized and and yelp a little bit. So is that the issue that, that I now... I'm given carte blanche to make this person fitter or uh, I mean, to me, <laughs> again, we're, we're maybe getting off uh, topic, but not having pride in yourself is quite often manifested in poor posture. Mm. When you see a person who has low self-esteem, get a psychology book. Here's a challenge for you. Get a psychology book uh, on clinical depression and they will show you the body postures that are indicative of depression. It is a slouched sitting posture, shoulders together, hands on the lap, just folded into the defeat of life. That person who stands in the same way is uh, also lacking of pride and uh, uh, possibly confidence. But in other words, there's something bigger going on here. Mm. And uh, if, if your job is to change their lives and give them confidence, give them an attitude that they're a winner and not a loser, they will start to stand like it with, with some pride. Mm. So th- this is a, a tremendous social issue, which um, I don't think gets uh, near enough uh, discussion. It was very disturbing for me in the last few years at the university when I would see the lack of personal pride that people had because of their posture. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but, that's probably a you lot know, related you, you, to phones you, as well. What, 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 what's attractive to you in, in a person? Would anyone find someone with who doesn't smile and with poor posture attractive, given all the other attributes they might have? No. What's the most attractive thing that, that lights up a room? It's beautiful posture and a nice smile. It's, it exudes confidence, mm. pride. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying in this, yeah, I yeah, hope. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, I, what we've seen it, or what I theorize about this whole thing is this whole piece on digital wellness. And there's a lot of research now, you know, good research coming out of good universities um, to show that, you know, the increase with phone usage above like a certain point, um, I think a lot of the studies are showing around six to eight hours is kind of like the 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 tipping point for a lot of people once people start hitting that six plus hours of phone usage per day um their instant like their reported levels of depression or how they would you know answer a <laughs> study or whatever it, it goes up a lot like they <laughs> and if you think about it, they're in that position a lot and i don't know if that's kind of like the chicken or the egg but 
they're becoming more and more depressed or they're at least self-diagnosing themselves as depressed. <laughs> so that definitely could have something to do with it. You think? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Six hours a day. Uh, they they really have a an enviable life, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the average is 10 hours. So You got to um, be kidding me. No, no, the average is 10 hours. Yeah, so um on a phone. Yeah, on a phone. Yeah, that's that's what um oh, that that was that was a study done on US citizens. So I don't know, I can't speak for the rest of the world. Oh, um, but, sad lives. Yeah. Oh, geez. Um so yeah, they're averaging 10 hours a day on their phone. Um, they're obviously getting more depressed and now we've, we're probably on your end, you're seeing what's coming in is like, oh, I've got lower back pain or I've got neck pain, um, which is, you know, you go, you will say, okay, well, what's the cause? And then you start seeing, okay, well, it's because you're on your phone 10 hours a day. Um, but why are they on their phone for 10 hours a day, right? Is it because right. they're, they're looking for something, they're searching for something, they're bored, they're addicted to these phones. So, it's going to be interesting to see how will, you know, can we fix their neck and their back issues if they've got this thing in their pocket that is constantly pulling them into a bad position that they're addicted to because they have some underlying you know issue or or need that needs to be oh, met of course that phone. yeah of course this is when i said i i see some people for three hours uh that initial interview that i do with them it might be a 10 inter 10 minute interview or it might be a one hour interview and uh in with with certain people with certain types of behaviors it may take that long to really get an understanding of all of these behaviors and the elements of their life that are driving them hmm. Hmm. but yeah. uh oh, geez i just couldn't imagine someone spending 10 hours on a phone <laughs> i mean that that's a pretty sad life oh, well, fun. it's the average so you see a lot of it i think it's just like one of those things where we're just moving into this time, this era where we don't really know what is coming next because we've created, we've essentially put the smartest minds in the world to turn the thing in our pocket into the most addictive thing in the world because if it is the most addictive thing and their algorithms serve you, you know, what you can be most addicted to, then you'll use it more and they'll get more money. And so we've kind of shown where, ourselves Where did in the you point. come up with the idea that they're the smartest minds in the world? Well, I mean, they are, I mean, Facebook and Instagram, right? They're in, in their field, right? They're recruiting essentially the best or well, people that are that are the experts in. No, no. They're recruiting unidimensional people who uh, might be good in one small area of their mind. I would argue that they're highly unbalanced people that they hire. Yeah. Well, I mean, these people are extremely good at creating algorithms or creating uh, or studying behavioral science so that they can get us more and more addicted to our phones that's how they're actually designing it so smart in that area for sure but i would say it's not smart because now they're essentially just burdening the population with you know higher instances of depression a forward head tilt position because they're on their phones all the time well that that i agree with you sure now they're just creating more problems and i don't even think they realized it i think they were just told hey we just need you to come in and we need you to increase you know people are spending an hour on this app we need you to take it to two right? Do whatever it yeah. takes. And so that's what they got really good at. But now... Yeah, well, engineers have been designing work. I used to say when I was a young professor, engineers design work to create patients. Mm. They were doing it back then and, and, and not, not maliciously, but just through being unaware, yeah. as, as I think you're pointing out. Yeah, it just puts All of these cool. things, uh, but isn't this good business for you? <laughs> It's good business for you. You're the, you're the one training back pain. Right. Well, I, but I'm trying to retire. I don't want the business. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but how do you see this playing out? Like, where do we, where does it have to go from here on your end? I mean, you, like, how would you theorize creating some kind of solution to this problem, which we see is getting worse and worse? Right. Well, I've thought a lot about that and I've had a lot of discussions with the smart people, as you call them. <laughs> Um, I don't know if there really is a solution primarily because until a person is motivated by their pain, they really don't want to listen that uh, certain behaviors are creating long-term health consequences. Damn. Have you looked into it all like any technology that you know, tracks your posture? Because you know, some people's watches these days, they like tell you if you've been sitting too long or standing too long because it can like tell yes. if you're standing or sitting. Have you experimented with anything like that? Well, I haven't experimented with them, but I've certainly seen it. But in our 
interventions with some people, we put them on schedules. Uh, for example, uh, you have to walk. Uh, now, let's take the person who they can only walk 20 meters before real intransigent back pain starts. Uh, that's a very low capacity. So what we will say is to guarantee success, you can only walk 10 meters, but we need you to do it every 30 minutes. We need you to interval walk to guarantee success every uh, 30 minutes. The next person might say, I can walk uh, five kilometers before the pain starts. Good. You're going to walk three times a day, 20 minutes quickly. And then we'll finally build them up to doing things that they want to do, which have higher uh, intensity to them, but obviously they don't do them as frequently. So, so the intervals shorten up with the, the more, uh, uh, triggered they are, shall we say. So I, I, again, I don't know if that, uh, answers your question, but, uh, it does to an extent. How often do you really just get people out of chairs? Like how often are you just like, okay, well the, the chair is such a massive cause here that it's just so easy to get a standing desk or just change around your lifestyle. So you go from, you know, maybe six hours sitting to one or two hours sitting. Right. Well, we, we, again, we get into their lives. You get out of bed in the morning, uh, you may have a coffee, and then you go for a walk. That's non-negotiable. If you're coming to me for back pain, that might be, for that individual person, uh, part of their prescription. And then they do whatever they're going to do, and you're not allowed to go to the lunchroom at uh, lunchtime. You're going to get out and go for a walk. You go for a walk when you get home. You go for a walk after supper. Uh Etc. So there's just an example where we'll institute. Uh, now they may have a uh, sit stand uh, workstation at work. Um, we'll try and figure out what the most healthful intervals are uh, for that particular person because certainly for those who stand all day, sitting is a rest. For those who sit all day, standing and walking is a rest. Mm. You know, the rest is the mechanical opposite of the chronic exposure. I like that. The rest is the mechanical it? opposite of the chronic exposure. And that goes for everything. So that's why the prescription is so different. Cause it's really just the emphasis. It sounds like is just doing something different to what you spend most of your day doing. Usually. Yes. Now there are certain situations where you have to combat very specific stresses as well. So some people are subject to neurogenic pain and compensations and the next person isn't. It's a very individual thing. So some people who uh, sit for a long period of time, when you watch them stand up, it's very difficult for them to pull their hips through. They have had a neurogenic facilitation of perhaps the psoas muscle. Mm. Not everybody, but in some, of course. Mm. Others uh, will have uh, much greater difficulty when you measure some uh, controlled movements that they have muscle inhibition in certain areas of their body. Mm. And when the pain comes, it really becomes uh, more noticeable. Uh, but is this in everybody? No, that's why you have to figure it out. Mm. That would be like, um, you know, what seems like a good relief. And uh, I've only, I, like you can really feel the tangible difference um, when you get the relief is like if you've been standing for a long period of time, like at a concert, for example, like three or four hours in a row and you haven't been, you know, paying too much attention, you're kind of sitting into your extension in your lower back and your back's really tired and really sore and then you drop into the deep squat and you get a little bit of that lower back flexion. It's like the most incredible relief ever. Like yeah. it feels so nice and that's exactly what you're just saying. Like the uh, Yeah, well, if you go to my book, Back Mechanic, that's exactly the prescription for some people once a day. Stand up, put your hands over your head, reach for the sky, suck in full air and elevate the rib cage. And then slowly exhale as you squat with your bottom right to the grass, no load. And then completely relax and surrender your body into the bottom of the deep squat. Mm -hmm. And then slowly unfold your neck, your T-spine, your lumbar spine into a neutral position. Start the hip drive and then stand up. So you went from full control right into it. Now, would I do that with a very uh, triggered, acute uh, open fissured posterior disc bulge? No, of course not. Yeah. But for another person, that might be exactly the release that they uh, that they need. Mm. Yeah, and you know, there's I hear this 
stuff. Oh, if you don't deep squat, uh, you'll lose it. Therefore, you should do heavy loaded deep squats throughout the day. There's no evidence for that. Mm. However, uh, if the person just does one full deep squat into complete relaxation in the bottom of the hole, so to speak, to use training vernacular, um, that's uh, about as effective as it, as, it, as it gets. You start pushing the joints under load at the end range of motion like that, and you'll become sensitized to uh, other issues. Mm. Uh, well, I want to jump into the final four, but before I do, I want to ask one um, interesting self, sorry, self-interested question. And I'm sure you probably get this a lot. Um, so sorry if it's, if you feel like you're repeating yourself on this, but you know, when people wake up, like when I wake up, I have a lot of stiffness. And so I go through a routine and essentially I'm trying to crack particular joints in my body. And immediately yeah. <laughs> after cracking those joints, like I feel tr- like significantly better. Like I almost can't put my hip or my back in that position until I've created like the the crack or whatever that that thing is called. Um, what is the actual? What is actually going on there? I don't know if we asked this last time, but like, yeah, if I if my hip say is only in ten degrees internal rotation, and then I crack it, I can get to like thirty degrees internal rotation. Uh, what what exactly is going on there? Well, I don't know. I've measured the mechanism in some people and not in others, and sometimes they're different. It could be a snapping tendon. It could be who knows what. Hmm. A snapping tendon. Can yeah. You explain what that is. A tendon is just on a bony uh, protuberance, and it just flops over uh, uh, onto the other side. So when you say a hip, uh, that might be uh, that might be that. Right. And would that, if you do that every day, would that cause wear of that tendon to the point it would like be? A I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We're gonna find out. I'll keep cracking my yeah. hip because it feels better <laughs> afterwards. So <laughs> I'll just, yeah, I'll just keep it going. Yeah, I mean, there are some people who crack their spine. And uh, what that does uh, in some people, because I've measured it, it creates an analgesic effect uh, because they uh, somehow stimulate the stretch reflex and they could get a a little um, analgesic jolly, so to speak, for maybe 12 minutes, 18 minutes, something like that. And then it refracts back to normal. So you might be stimulating the the stretch reflex. Mm. But once again, I don't know. Um, However... Uh, what I will do if that's linked to their pain and joint laxity and that kind of thing, uh, and we feel they need to stiffen their joints because we've proven that makes them more pain resilient, then we'll just say stop that and replace it with another behavior. So every, every time you want to crack your back, for example, getting out of bed, what I'm going to say is uh, I'll, I'll assess and I might say to you, tomorrow when you wake up, The first thing I want you to do is lay on your tummy in bed and then inhale. And then as you exhale, image your low back falling into the mattress. You're laying on your tummy and slowly work through into some extension that way. And then get out of bed, uh, one leg. um, How can I explain this now? Sidestepping off the bed, if you can imagine, pulling your hips through and maybe suck in a little air and reach for the ceiling uh, and uh, just leave it like that and see if you still need to um, crack your uh, joint if we measured that to be part of the uh, pain syndrome. Yeah. So there's just an example of a, uh, understanding the mechanism will right. lead us to a better uh, behavior. Yeah, right. for sure. Nice. Okay, so we got our final four questions. You answered them last time. See if the uh, nah, yeah. answers have changed. Um, so, first question is... Well, oh, I don't really remember them, so... That's good. <laughs> That's good. So you, in your mind, you barely answered them. Um, so, first question is, uh, if you had an opportunity to sit down and interview anyone that's alive today, um, who would you choose and why? Okay. Wow. Um, I think I probably said last time Muhammad Ali, but he's no longer alive. Okay. Do you remember what I said? I don't know, but I feel like Muhammad Ali... Maybe it was, wasn't alive when you answered it last time. Oh, okay. Well, it certainly that would have been my answer. But if you say living, um, you, you might find this uh, surprising. Um, I, I mean, I think I've I've met with pretty much all of the celebrities and and people like that who, uh, you know, who I really would like to meet. 
Um, uh, just for fun, I, I, I might like to meet uh, Putin or uh, uh, Trump, maybe. Okay. What uh, if you had to choose one or the other? Well, let's say I don't know. Let's uh, let's say it's Putin. What what kind of stuff are you asking him? I just create a general conversation and uh, see how he maneuvers uh, the uh, his his way through them or around them or if he's straightforward or. Or what? And then uh, I'd probably uh, it, 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 in this. Do I get a guarantee of straight answers? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. I'd ask all kinds of questions about world security. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to know the truthful <laughs> answers to those. It uh, probably give you a lot of paranoia. I would assume. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. More optimistic view of it. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's fair. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, he'd probably have some back pain anyway because he wasn't he a black belt in judo or something. So I'm sure you could probably help him out there. Uh, yeah, th- this I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what my brother told me, and he's he's deep into uh, kind of like I don't know Russian politics and and jujitsu and all kinds of MMA stuff. So he was pretty certain. Yeah, he was a. He yeah, was a- I mean, if as as you know, uh, with our science, if if you follow it. Uh, a lot of it has uh, a lot of its initial scientific uh, principles and roots in in Russian science. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Especially a lot of strength and conditioning. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're they've made tremendous contributions over the years. Yeah. Um, nice. So, second question is: uh, Do you do any sort of routine, or do you have any sort of habit that you do every single day that you feel? Like <laughs> <is>? <laughs> Um, well, when I get up in the morning, I've got to have coffee, right? That's not negotiable. Yeah. Um, what, like if you had to choose, uh, the best place, you've been to a lot of places in the world. If you had to choose one place that you think has the best coffee in the world, where is it? Oh, fabulous question. Um, I don't like the small Italian coffees, but I love the large Italian coffees and, and yeah, pretty much anywhere in Europe has, uh, uh, great coffees, I would say. So you mean you like um, it's still black, but you just prefer if it's a full cup as opposed to a shot. right? Yeah, yeah, the very small, very intense coffees. What I, I I would avoid. Hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess, not quite so strong and more volume for sure. I guess then, if you're a big fan of coffee, then um, and you said you weren't really particularly had your heart set on anything to do while you're in Sydney. Um, I feel like it's only appropriate that we take you for the um, official um, Sydney coffee tour. Uh, which is, you know, created by myself um, and uh, involves multiple locations. Can be, depends on your caffeine tolerance, but um, can be anywhere up to like seven or eight <laughs> of the best coffees in Australia. Now, the reason... Well, sorry, you got yourself a, a deal on that. Yeah. You got yourself a deal, but it won't be eight coffees. <laughs> okay. Let me it'll, sell it. Let me be, keep selling you on it. Two at the most and we'll have a good laugh and a good discussion. Yeah, perfect. Well, let me just, uh, yeah, I'll give you, I'll sell you on it. Um, another other ways like you could go to uh, what a lot of people would say hey these are really good coffee shops but there's only about seven or eight different beans that are being roasted in Sydney that are circulating amongst those coffee shops right um, so it does kind of come down to the barista and how they use it but at the end of the day they're all kind of using the same beans what how I design this this tour is you actually go to the places that roast those beans so you're going to the place that everywhere buys their beans off. So it's like the yeah. the freshest and the best of the best in Sydney. Yeah, my my host actually in Sydney is a, a real coffee connoisseur. He may have taken me to one of the two of those places. He's okay. a fabulous host. I'll have to discuss with him his yeah. level of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know who Richard Chu is? Richard Chu. Do you know Richard? No. Yeah. Anyway, he's uh a long time good friend okay yeah great well yeah um we'll, we'll make sure that we get you on the coffee tour even if we're not in attendance yeah. we can uh, still write the list out for you <laughs> okay fabulous um great okay third question uh is there anything recently that you've changed your mind on that for a while you held as a strong belief uh not really <laughs> haven't changed your mind recently no oh, ha- haven't changed the mcgill big three didn't tell anyone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I uh, can't think of. Uh, uh, I've I've gained a bit more knowledge, I would say, and experience. But in terms of fundamental beliefs and principles, I don't think I've changed much in uh, a lot of years. 
And um, well, since you retired, did anything kind of change about like your maybe how you thought retirement might be like, or maybe um, just something? Oh yeah, that, that for sure. I never thought it would be so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I well, right now I I am in such a sweet spot of my life. I have no pain. Uh, every day I, I do a bit of training. I do a bit of work. I do a bit of computer work. I, I might see a patient. Uh, I go for a walk with my dog. I, I, I have a fabulous, fabulous life right now. It's never been so good. I never thought retirement would be this good. Do you think it's because part of the reason is because you it, essentially what it sounds like is you have freedom. You have you wake up every day and you have the choice to do only exactly what you want to do. You don't have yes. to be anywhere that you don't have to be. You have that fr- like right. true freedom. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, it's a it's a fabulous, fabulous feeling. Now, mind you, I'm very, very busy, but uh, I pick and choose. Yeah, but I think that's what the thing is, right? It's 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 busy, but it's by choice. It's the stuff that you yeah. want to do. Whereas, you know, uh, I'm. Not going to put like words in your mouth about how your life was, but I just assume that you know, with the university, even though you love that work, you still have to show up at a time. Like you couldn't just sleep in and wake up and do whatever you want. It's like those things because they're you know, someone else is paying you. You have to be there for those times. So when you take that, oh away, yeah, you're on a ten minute schedule all day long. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you just have your schedule, you're like, oh no, I'm not doing that thing today because I don't want to. So I'm not going right. to. And that's like that freedom, right? And I, I can go at things in a very relaxed way. So if I want to talk to you. Uh, I, I do that. Uh, there's a hard beginning, not necessarily a hard ending. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I I have a project out of my shop tonight. I'm going to weld up a couple of brackets. So I will take my time. If I don't finish them tonight, who cares? So it's just, it's fabulous. Yeah. Well, I, um, look, I think you deserved, um, you know, all of it, you know, you've helped so many people around the world, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people get out of pain, if not millions at some point. So if anyone deserves it, it's, it's you. So you've done a fabulous job there. I don't know if people tell you that enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. Look, I'll, I'll, th- I'll thank you in person more and I'll, I'll take you some good coffee spots. But um, final question, Stuart, is uh, besides your own books, is there any book that you would recommend that you've read recently to the audience? No, no. I haven't read one recently. Oh, I, sorry. I have Dan John's book. I just read that. Now I'm trying to think of the name. Dan what, what's Dan John's the, new the book? Strength coach? 40 Years with a Whistle. He's like the coach. And he, like a, he's a strength coach as well, right? He's a strength coach in the US, Dan John. And I believe the title of the book is called 40 Years with a Whistle. Wow. And they're just short little chapters. So my old brain can consume them. They're funny. They've got a lot of wisdom. And uh, he's a great writer. So uh, there you go. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. And your book, uh, can really I ask a question book. on the body mechanic? Is that is that mostly for trainers to help their clients with back pain? Or like if anyone's got back pain, you'd really recommend they read the book? Uh, my, you mean my book? Yeah, the, the back yeah, mechanic. It's called sorry. Back Mechanic. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's for anyone who owns a painful back. No. Oh. That's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, for the listeners, if you are interested in hanging out with Stuart, learning from him, you have uh, a course, um, the McGill Summit is what it's called. So, it's four days. You're going to be in Sydney in February. Uh, I think it was Mel- uh, Melbourne in, in January into February. So, late Jan mm-hmm. into Feb. Correct. Yes, um, that's correct. And you mentioned at the start, it's basically for anyone who helps other people. So, coaches... PTs, clinicians, physios, um, you can do the entire course, which is obviously like your highest recommendation. You get the broader set of skills and knowledge. It's probably the best investment. Um, or you can kind of handpick certain days amongst the summit as well. Um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure, what's your, what is the website where people can, can find out more info about this? Yes, our website is, well, the company is called Backfit Pro. So the website is backfitpro.com. Okay, great. Awesome. If you guys are interested, head over there. Awesome. Yeah. Stuart, thank you so much for being on. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you both. Your your questions today were interesting, not always the uh, things I, I normally get. So you took me to a few locations where uh, I don't often go. So thank you two very much. No, you're welcome. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Okay.